Hello, this is Frederick van Amstel. I'm speaking from the University of Florida and I'm giving this pre-recorded version for my keynote at the Doctor Consortium at DRS 2024, Boston, as a matter of precaution, whether I cannot meet in time. However, this will be also shared on my YouTube channel for other people to um, engage with this content, because maybe they are also facing some similar existential crisis that doctor design, that design research doctor students might be facing. Well, first of all, I have to disclose quickly my uh, positionality as a Latino immigrant living in the United States, a heterosis man. Um, United States, by the way, is an unceded indigenous land that have been taken by the colonialists, by the settlers that here installed themselves and they never paid back. That's something that we definitely need to acknowledge every time we speak on uh, these lands. Uh, I cannot really go too much into the detail of the implications of this positionality disclosure, but they, they definitely add up to this existential crisis that I'm feeling and that you're probably also feeling. So maybe with this presentation, I'll provide some tools and practical advice that will help you to find other people that are going through similar crisis. If you want to check my, my website at fredvanamstel.com, you may find the references and the works that I'm being uh, referring in this presentation and further engagements that you may have with my own scientific and uh, practical work. First of all, let me contextualize that I'm not the only one interested and concerned about existential crisis in design research. There has been a book uh, edited by two or three, uh, two um, special interest groups associated with the Design Research Society, the Global Health SIG and the Pluriversal Design SIG. They compiled this very interesting and thought-provoking book called The Little Book of Design's Existential Crisis in 2000 and 22. And this book tells you that if you're not in an existential crisis as a designer in social design, you are not doing it right. <laughs> if you're not having that, that same in design education, you're not doing it right. And in sustainable design, well-being, health, and so forth and so forth, they are all um, supposed to be having in this in existential crisis. So maybe these are indeed times that design researchers are undergoing through those crises because also other people in our society are undergoing such crises. But then we can do a little bit better than just um, let you know that it's okay to have a crisis. What if we can provide some uh, theoretical and practical tools to handle them collectively? Before I jump into those, I want to uh, share a trigger warning because this presentation might help you or might not help you while we're coping with your memories of sleep deprivation, mental suffering, suicidal thoughts, sexual harassment, LGBTQ plus phobia, sexism, racism, and neoliberalism in your doctoral research experience. If you feel uncomfortable with anything that I have said so far, afterwards you can type in an email on f.fanamstow at ufl.edu. Um, please feel free to drop any critical comments and also share the kind of crisis that you have faced or you are facing right now and that you would like to um, to share with me. But bear in mind that I'm not a, <laughs> a professional capable of actually helping people with mental suffering and all of these situations that have been just described. What I can do is share how we are handling with our, in my own research and with other researchers that I collaborate with. And uh, uh, while f being part of many doctoral design research projects, I've noticed that the main crisis that um, students and researchers in this situation face is, do my research really make any, any difference in the world? So this anguish, this feeling of being doing something that is irrelevant haunts uh, design researchers in this level and they are always wondering whether they are actually doing anything that nobody else have done before that will add up to the world. And reading about your topic to check if someone else have done it before, to check if you're not doing the same as some as, as new research uh, are presenting and to find the relevance in general. But that's not 
helping with the coping with the crisis. So you start questioning about which world are you talking about? What kind of difference I'm making that world? And is not is that really making or is it designing a difference? So reading gets you deeper into the contradiction that is lying behind that existential crisis and acknowledging your designers. And I thank uh, Alfredo Gutierrez Borrero for coining this very interesting term in his own PhD thesis that you can uh, later on search for. Um, um, and he says that designers, they have a lot of knowledge that they don't know and they it's not normal it's okay not to know for most of design research projects however for a phd a doctor research well you are supposed to stay at the top of knowledge in that field you cannot just acknowledge your design neurons and not answer those questions whether my research makes any difference in the world you have to show you have to prove that your research indeed adds up to something However, one day I, I once heard that the best way to approach that challenge is to create a new field for, that only fits yourself, that you are the first one. So you are the pioneer and you create a new concept, new theories, new methods, new approaches to solve an original problem that nobody else has looked at before. I, I heard this from a, a seasoned, a very experienced design researcher, but that person had a lot of privileges that person was staying at the top of his field. Indeed, following that advice or not, I don't know. The thing is that not many people can afford <laughs> to create their own field. And besides that, would that be really a better world if just one person would know everything about that thing and nobody else would? Should experts actually hold the privilege to say what is a better world and design for it? <laughs> well, I suppose that I'm trying to provoke you to think deeper about this problematic because indeed there are many worlds, at least what, that's what uh, my colleagues in the Pluriversal Design Working Group have found while engaging with the Futures of Design Education Research Project. And in this project we found out that design education and design practice is, is so diverse across the world that it's, you cannot even say that they are belong to the same world. They actually operate in different worlds. And if we respect those different worlds, we must be humble with our assumptions. And, and you cannot really claim that we are, are experts into something that the entire world is interested on. Maybe there's a very narrow community interested in what we do, or maybe there's none. And that adds up to uh, the initial question does that make any difference? You, we may be very well connected to a world, but does that change that world anyway? Well, irrespective of your worldview, you may not even agree with the pluriversal worldview or views of this pluriversality worldview. You must still prove yourself in front of local, national, international, and or, well, I have to say, global North research community. Most of the times, even if you are operating in the Global South and you are defending your research in front of a Global South uh, committee, uh, these people will evaluate your work in relation to what is being produced in the Global North. That's why I'm putting so much emphasis on this community that is going to test and go wants to see you being uh, original and not just your thesis or your project work, your contribution is actually your existence. And your existence there is being questioned, not your thesis. First of all, what the research community wants to know, who is this person claiming this contribution? And that takes a lot of uh, burden on your psychological well-being and the pressure that you feel. Because unlike other means of publishing your research, for example, submitting papers to conferences like DRS or to a, a journals um, like um, the Design Journal, for example, you go through a, a peer review process and especially a blinded peer review process where you don't know who are the reviewers of your uh, research and these reviewers don't know who is the author of that research they're evaluating. So there's some kind of uh, impersonality in that process that 
di diverge a little bit from um, the identity of the author or the researcher who is making those claims of truth. Um, but in a PhD defense that you face by the end of your trajectory, you cannot avoid that. And I can quickly remember how I was a bit nervous, actually quite nervous in my PhD defense in 2015 at the University of Twente because I was this Latino immigrant hetero cis man there in front of um, a, a, a committee member composed of all a white uh, old male <laughs> Europeans and they were scrutinizing my work from the perspective of the global north and I was prepared for that somehow because my references were all mostly based on global north but that was not entirely true about my existence there because the global south was the one who actually raised me and made it possible to stay in that moment uh, getting instruction in the Global North was very important, but that was just a small piece of my research trajectory and I could not pay enough honor to the Global South as I would like to in that particular situation. However, after the committee members left, <laughs> I share with my uh, fellow colleagues uh, in a more um, easier situation where we are waiting, actually, I was uh, relaxed, uh, but then we are waiting for the final word about the committee on my work. And um, yeah, I was hiding a lot of my um, feelings about that situation. I was hiding my cultural background and my stand again in relationship to that situation. I could not express myself freely, but then I hide these colorful uh, uh, socks and, and it was a very interesting moment to share that with my friends. And uh, in many cases in academia, you are facing this situation not just in your PhD thesis defense, where you have to hide yourself. And that's something that is, becomes even um, more dramatic if you come from um, other oppressed social groups. I mentioned that I come from the Global South, that's an oppressed social group, and if you consider geopolitics, but um, women, uh, black people, um, uh, immigrants in general, and um, disabled, these are all people that historically have been oppressed and they are not they need to prove their existence in a situation that is less um, favorable to them actually they need to prove their existence much more than me for example in many other situations not just in academia to begin with these people are not supposed to be here you if you are one of these oppressed people you're not supposed to be here even in this doctoral consortium these are places of privilege that are somehow exclusionary you have a lot of mechanisms that prevent people that are really oppressed to come out of the way here. For example, to begin with, these um, events, they occur in the global north and it's very expensive to travel all the way here. And then you have conference fees that are really high and then you have um, a peer review process that might not take into consideration all the, uh, the differences in the epistemologies, the methodology that you bring from the global south or from your communities where you come from. So yeah, this kind of uh, situation, the research communities are somehow created and the gatekeepers are the ones, the people that evaluate your work to decide whether you're gonna present or publish your work or have a successful defense. Um, and, and these people, they know that you are a bit weird, a bit strange, you are a bit uh, other than them and with the things that you say, with the things that you do, you make this research community feel uncomfortable. So somehow they would like to have to get rid of you as soon as possible and stay uh, close to the people that are like them. That's what oppressors do. People that are on the privileged side, they uh, have a hard time to face the situation of underprivileged because um, they don't understand what it's like not to have those privileges. And, and that has a consequence with uh, the ideas that you have, everything that you think about, because you have gone through that different experience of being uh, disenfranchised and understanding the contradictions, feeling those contradictions closer to your body, they don't fit within the current frameworks, with the current theories, the biggest debates in the fields that are shaped in the global north. So let me give you an example that I faced 
um, someone uh, in my uh, research community said, well, this topic Y that you are looking is not a topic really here. Why don't you research X? In my case, Y was oppression. So I wanted to research oppression. But then there is a research community said, well, this is not really a topic here. We don't have oppressed people in the global north. Why don't you research building information modeling? And I did my PhD thesis. You will find a chapter about building information modeling. And I really wanted to have a PhD thesis about operation. I couldn't, but then after I graduated, I finished my project and I started really to dig into that. And while I was writing my PhD thesis, I was learning and, and keeping that in my mind, this bothering uh, thought that, you know, X is really irrelevant for people like you, but you are compelled to do it because I need to have the degree. I need to finish this uh, project and go to the next one and search for funding and institutional support. And at some point, if you keep up with this contradiction, uh, with this, um, this rupture in your identity, you feel like an imposter because you are trying to uh, stand as if you are doing something uh, out of your heart, out of your honesty, but you know that this is not entirely true. You would uh, rather do something else that will be a, somehow in your perspective more uh, contributing, making a bigger difference or more relevant difference in the world. And that is the moment when an existential crisis can become an existential threat. This is the most um, uh, sensitive part of this presentation. You feel the void of consciousness in the very process of developing the maximum possible consciousness about something. Because you are now becoming um, the scientist or the researcher that knows the, the most about that specific thing. And you are not doing that alone and you're not doing that boundless. There's a lot of pressure upon you and that pressure is taking away your consciousness that you should have at the maximum level. That's, these are concepts and this whole presentation is shaped after this incredible book, Ciência e Existência, Problemas Filosóficos da Pesquisa Científica, written by Álvaro Vira Pinto, a Brazilian philosopher, unfortunately not yet available in Portuguese in English, as most uh, works that have been produced in the Global South, you will hardly hear about those authors. But this one is a very interesting existentialist and critical approach to um, the, the, the positionality of a researcher in a society that faces these kind of contradictions like oppression. So the result, uh, according to Alvaro Vira Pinto, and also um, my uh, observations of my peers and my own experience is that you get alienated uh, with that conflict or that contradiction, you get depressed. You may quit your PhD position and you may even die. And you may die afterwards, you may die before you come there. But none of this really matter to science because science unfortunately advances further. If people die earlier, yes, that's a striking result of these um, authors Pierre Azulay and colleagues, they published a paper in America Economic Review in 2019 entitled Does Science Advance One Funeral at a Time? And they looked at the, the, the um, bibliography data of certain authors that had uh, early deaths that didn't produce until the age of retirement. And they noticed a pattern going on that once these authors died, irrespective of the reason, um, after they died, their field grows because other authors and other researchers, they fill in that gap, that uh, vacuum, that space left by uh, that body that um, was deceased. Uh, so it's an opportunity for these new researchers to occupy that space and keep doing the scientific work. So that's not really perhaps a collective way of producing and giving homage to people that have dedicated their lives to science. But that's the way currently, according to our capitalist uh, structures, how science is being developed. How do you live through this situation? How do you survive your doctor research? I'm not here 
to tell um, all about the, these nasty things without really having anything to add up on how to deal with that. But I cannot give you small and simple tips as you can find in social networks in, under this uh, PhD chat uh, tag. So I'm not talking about uh, work-life balance and all kinds of very shallow level um, issues because this will not really tackle the underlying contradictions. What I really find most important after my own experience and observing others is that you may fight for the existence of people like you in academia. And I'm not saying fight for your existence, but really trying to broaden your research for scope and uh, your existence there. So you will represent uh, other people like you or you create spaces for these other people to speak through your research. So some people would say giving voice, but I would say you're actually listening to um, to unheard voices or erased voices in the history of the thing that you are researching. And if you are uh, if you are not oppressed um, in the same way as these people, so you're not like them, but you may be oppressed in a different way. Try to make bridges between the oppressed people. That might also be an important motivation to face these contradictions. Because in the end, this is not fighting alone. This is fighting collectively for our existence. And I, term, I define this together with my colleague, uh, Rodrigo Gonzato. We call it collective existential project. And all, all of our research projects, they based on this concept. So we are always trying in recent years, especially through the Design and Oppression Network, to develop collective existential projects that um, make this existence possible in the academia, but also in the, uh, the worlds that these people have been threatened to exist. And in these collective existential projects, your most important contribution will always be yourself, not your thesis. Considering your relationality, positionality, reflexivity, critical consciousness, whatever suits your research, think about it. Your research is most important because of you. <laughs> and I'm gonna go back now to in 2015, just uh, after my PhD thesis was over and, and I, I defended successfully, I gave a, a more relaxed presentation to my colleagues at the University of Twente. And in that one, I, I, I shared with them the real scientific contribution of my PhD research. But was really thinking about what change I was doing, not just my thesis in the world. And this was the slide I presented. Uh, really, it's really a no design slide uh, on purpose because the main contribution of my research is myself, a capable researcher in the reserve army of scientific, scientific labor. I can produce papers, the commodities of the scientific market. So I came to the conclusion that I was just another cog in this big factory of um, scientific paper publishing that generates some kind of weird distortion of what science is. But I was critical about this. Actually, I avoided a lot of tactics to avoid my, the commodification of my scientific work. So I questioned the dominant forms of knowledge. I prevent mindless operationalization of theories. I problematize instead of problem solving, and I eat my own dog food. So I try to live up to the theory and to, to be coherent with the things that I'm saying or writing about, I try to apply in my life and also my professional work. So how do you feel about these things I'm presenting? Are you in crisis now? Wait a minute, reach out to people who are facing the same. Don't worry, organize to exist. If you find other people that are facing that, uh, a lot of strengths can come uh, together and then you can fight this better. And you can actually do good in this uh, scientific environment if you um, start collaborating with these people. This can create networks and networks are so much valuable nowadays for uh, being in this business, this <laughs> scientific business, because it has become a business of trying to get some funding. And then with that funding, you run the research project, you publish the outcomes, and then you get more funding and so on and so on. And I've been lucky to have found uh, like-minded people in the Citational Justice Collective, P3 
SPD Commoner Split Reversal Working Group, and last but not least, my favorite one, the Design and Oppression Network that has been founded in 2020. It has been also my most important laboratory to develop these kind of concepts and ideas that I'm presenting now. And these uh, networks can be clearly observed if you look at my co-authorship network. If you look at all the co-authors that have published papers with me, you will find uh, these authors that are recurrent and they appear in some kind of order that corresponds to this network. So these networks generate opportunities for doing research and then getting publications out of that. So that's a way of thriving. But as a, as a person who still holds a lot, some privileges as a, as a heterosis man, and in Brazil uh, identifies as a, uh, uh, socialized as a white person, I, I, I still have some privileges that I have to share. So I'm always trying to find co-authors that are underprivileged disenfranchised, I give them more attention to the other people that are privileged. And as you can see, even in, if I look at the numbers of my publications, uh, the co-authorship uh, uh, characteristics, I find that I'm have been successful so far. So I have mostly co-authored with uh, peers, not uh, exploiting my students. I, I, I'm, my, most of my co-authors are from the Global South or they are located in the Global South. Most of them are la uh, Latino people. Um, yeah, there are some, some black, some Asian, some Middle Eastern, and yeah, a bit of white people. And with gender speaking, most of them are uh, um, uh, women, a little bit more than men, and I'm trying to improve those uh, diversity uh, indicators. This is not just a concern for institutions, it's also a concern for ourselves because each one of us is an enterprise in this scientific market. Where to find co-authors then? I'm gonna uh, take the opportunity now to use this Dr. Consortium keynote to stimulate you to find uh, like-minded people and for that I'm gonna use the Crisis Deck. It's a tool that has been developed by uh, my former students Alani Zukowski and Maria Vittori Kosaki for the final work at UTFPR in Brazil, in the Global South. It depicts 10 existential crises found among fresh design graduates. And it is a design livery open source project. You can contribute to its further development. You can download it. I'm going to show you in a few minutes. First of all, let me share how we, can, we are using uh, this tool in the University of Florida, where I'm located now. We have this marvelous MXD MFA program. And these students come from all over the globe to study co-design with us. And in one of the classes, we introduced the existential crisis deck, and they had to pick a card and tell a story. And that was a very simple way of using those cards. And out of that, one student got really interested on working with existential crisis. Her name is Hien Fans. She is Vietnamese, and she was working uh, in an interesting uh, co-ethnography work about her experience of being a design student in the US. And then she used in her initial planning phase the crisis that she was she was she took from the card deck the crisis that she was facing on her own situation and she co connected them to another card deck called Baca. I'm not going to explain what it is right now, but it was an uh, important opportunity for her to think about who is she now and who she wants to become in the future and how going through those existential crises was something that she could tap and to uh, her projects. She could explore those because maybe those crises that she's facing were also crises that her colleagues, uh, other students were also facing the same program. That's what she did next. So she talked to cards to other students and she started to dig deeper into the social contradictions that causes those existential crises. That's what her ethnographic work is all about. And this is a very recent analysis uh, of uh, initial thoughts about those crises. She brought new data in, and now she has a different understanding about those crises, especially regarding what triggers them and what historically have brought her to that. She doesn't know what she's gonna actually implement next out of this existential crisis investigation, but that's a work in progress, and, and she will probably, uh, I suppose, find like-minded people <laughs> to get this project published in the future. So now I'm gonna handle for people that are in person in this uh, Dr. Consortium, one copy of the prototype that I quickly printed at my office for you to explore this and to find like-minded people. Um, you can also download this on my website 
And before uh, we go to the next step, just understand what's going on, I'm gonna show you all of the cards, there are 10 cards. Uh, each time I show a card, I will give a few seconds for you to raise if you identify with the crisis. So if you are facing that crisis now, or if you have faced and you wanna to talk to people that are facing that crisis, just stand up and look around and, and try to remember who are these people because later on you might have time throughout the conference or across the week to meet these people to talk with and maybe found a new network, a uh, new research network and collaborations. Are you ready for that? Okay, let's start. So I'm not going to explain any of these uh, cards, what they mean, because they are supposed to be uh, something that I'm um, big enough to um, stimulate you to relate. If you don't relate at all, just don't do anything, to keep uh, uh, sitting in your seat and then uh, wait for the next one. As you can see, those pictures, they uh, uh, were being carefully crafted to use some kind of a language that don't rely on words. On purpose, this all comes back from uh, theater of the press practices and critical pedagogy. They both uses, use this kind of uh, generative images. So these images are supposed to express a contradiction that people face in reality, that they may have a debate about it. Bear in mind that those cards, they have two faces and each crisis is, can only be understood if you take the two sides into consideration. So if you uh, have found someone that are facing the same existential crisis as you, please organize to exist. That's my best piece of advice in this doctoral consortium. I hope you have a great conference experience and take the opportunity to meet like-minded people. Thank you. And if you want to check more materials like this, uh, the crisis deck, and uh, scientific work that I have been doing about uh, dealing with existential crisis and designing against oppression, check my website at fredfanamsto.com. Thank you very much.